Have you been sitting in the sidelines for too long and are worried you've lost all the opportunities to invest or you're waiting for either a housing correction or an ETF bubble to burst or simply just waiting for the situation to diffuse between Russia and Ukraine? If so, this video is for you. In this video, I break down five steps you need to start your investing journey this year. Let's get started. The first step towards starting an investing journey is to simply differentiate between what an asset is and what a liability is. This concept was made popular by Robert Kiyosaki, who's the author of Rich Dad Poor Dad, one of the best selling personal finance books. He talks about how the rich accumulate assets while the middle class accumulate liabilities they think are assets. Let's further break this down. The image you see on screen now is directly taken from the book. It's simply an income statement of all the classes. So let's examine this. So if you take a look at the poor people or the financial unsuccessful people's income sheet, we can see that they get their money, so their income, and directly goes to the expenses. These people are generally living paycheck to paycheck. If you go over to the middle class, we can see that these people, their income comes in and it goes to their liabilities, then it goes to the expenses. And you may see that a mortgage is listed there as a liability. Robert Kiyosaki has been very, very controversial in that regard as he claims your house is not an asset and many, many people would disagree and say it is. The philosophy behind that, if it's not bringing money in your pocket, it's a liability because if you own a mortgage, you're generally putting money outward. He doesn't say that for investment properties. So if an investment property, a property you don't live in, is giving you a cash flow positive return or just a net positive return in the end, considers that an asset. And the reason why many people would disagree, obviously, is because the rise in equity of their house, because they can use the equity to buy another property because, you know, house prices always go up. If you were around the time of 2009, when the housing market crashed in America, you would see many people lost their homes, their livelihood, and the actual value of the house was less than they originally purchased it from, which is quite scary. Obviously, the American and Australian economy are vastly different, and I don't want to compare the two. So it's up to you to do your own research. And regarding the definition of an asset, a traditional definition is actually that an asset is something that increases in value over time. And a house ticks that box considered an equity point of view. But Robert Kiyosaki's definition is a bit more stricter and more rigid. Now, if we look at the rich income statement, we can see that the assets are actually putting money into their pocket. So they're actually generating income. And this goes back to a, a famous quote by Warren Buffett is that if you can't find a way to make money while you're sleeping, you will work till you die. And that's very scary to hear because think about it, if your income is tied to your time, then there's no escape really. You can only earn more and just save. That's it. The second step I have for you to start your investing journey this year, which I believe is one of the most important out of all these other steps, is to distinguish between active and passive income. This is relevant for whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced. And I see many, many people slipping into this mistake and it's very, very scary. So active income is simply income you derive by trading your time for money. Simple, just nine to five work. You do your work between nine to five, you get paid hourly. So you're trading time for money. Passive income is simply getting income that's not tied to your time. And there's no such thing as true passive income as you still got to work to generate either upfront or throughout maintenance. But the whole idea is you're simply just loosening or weakening the tie between how many hours you work and how much you get paid. It's not directly tied together. Sort of it's exponential in a way. And it's only like dividends or equity from real estate where it's passive. But the main goal is for you to either increase the value of your time substantially or simply make sure your time isn't directly tied to your money. Those are the two goals you should focus on. This may sound like common sense, but bear with me because I believe this is the most important step in this journey to investing because many people, they may be saying, oh, I don't do that. Well, I guarantee you will know a lot of people that do this. In fact, if it is not you yourself. So let me give an example. So let's say you work a nine to five, Monday to Friday, 40 hours, boom. And you want to pick up some extra work because you want some extra cash for something, some sort of event, some holiday or some birthday party, let's say. And let's say you do what anyone else would do. What would they do? They maybe go Uber, DoorDash, Uber Eats, or maybe find a sort of local retail store, just do a shift here and there. The problem I have with this approach is that you are getting extra income, but problem is you're not improving anything. You're just getting extra work. You're just working more. Obviously, you get paid more if you're working more. You're not improving your skill. A much better approach, let's say even if you don't invest in like stocks, real estate, crypto, whatever, you don't even invest, a much better ROI return on investment for your time would simply be to just improve your skills. Simple as that. If you dedicated that time into improving your skills, you would have a far greater return. You're getting extra income, which you couldn't derive from your active income stream. Why not just increase the income from your active income stream? Instead of earning, let's say 60,000, you start earning 75,000. That's the thing. You're still working those 40 hours here and there. It's still the 40 hours, but you're just getting paid more. And that's a much wiser approach. I'm not against 
it's the idea of working hard. I completely understand you got to work hard and it's very important and it's a very important skill, but you got to work hard in a smart manner, which is key. And you should go until a point where it's like, once you've determined or once you've established your emergency fund, because after that, it's just, yeah, you're getting extra income, but your time is far more valuable and you're just wasting it. You might as well just go four or five months just studying more. What I'd encourage you to do a much more wiser way besides increasing the value for your time is also to do a side hustle, which isn't necessarily tied with your time. So some of these side hustles include something like Amazon FBA, dropshipping, automated YouTube videos, even just normal YouTube, anything you can think of where you may have to put in effort, but in the long run, it will compound and it will lead to something much better rather than just working an entry level role because a lot of people can do them and you're not learning anything which can increase the value of your time. To simply put it, you either want to increase the value of your time or you want to separate your time from your money. Just try and separate as much as you can because you don't want it to be directly correlated. And it's best to do both if you can, but think of this in a simple way. Let's say you improve 1%, even every day. Let's say it's just your skill. Maybe you read 10 pages, you read 30 pages, you, know, you watch a YouTube video on whatever skill you're doing. So if you're doing like data science, read something on new languages or something. Let's say you do that. Over time, at the end of the year, if you do 1% every day, 365 days, that would equate to 365% gain, which is 3.5 times where you were initially. That's more than double. That's phenomenal. So think of small actions that have a higher return on investment. So either you're increasing the value of your time or you're trying to separate time from your incrementing potential. Focus on that. I guarantee you that will save you so much headaches and heartaches in the future. The third step for your investing journey this year is to create a system. And what I'm referring to a system in this scenario is a system to keep lifestyle inflation in check by paying yourself first. So what lifestyle inflation is, is simply a concept where the more you earn, the more you spend. And I'm sure most of you would have seen this with friends, relatives, they got a new promotion, they start dressing better, they get a new suit, new shoes, better car, heck, they may even move to a bigger house. That simply just refers to just spending more as you earn. And that's why many people get stuck in the rat race because they earn more, but they spend more. So this margin's still the same, it's not increasing. And what paying yourself first refers to is simply taking a portion of your pay slip beforehand, like let's say 10, 20%, and just keeping aside for your own thing. So you can spend it on whatever you wanna do, be guilt free. And this is quite important for very frugal people like me. So the author of the book, which I highly recommend to you guys, The Barefoot Investor, written by Scott Pape, has organized a system of his pay into buckets. And now I'll show you how those buckets are structured. So if I pull up the screen now of the bucket, you can see that there's a tap and three buckets. The tap represents 100% of your take home pay. So that's after tax pay in your account. So what you can think of the three buckets as our account, but for the simple purpose of explanation, we'll go with buckets. So the first bucket is blow. The blow bucket is for expenses and some splurging. And then you have your mojo bucket, which is your emergency fund, which I highly preach. And then you have your grow. This can be used for your savings, but mainly towards investments. And you don't have to organize it like this necessarily. You can do it however you want in your own subdivisions. But the whole idea is to give you a sort of perspective that the author or many people use it like. So you can have your own bucket for, let's say you want to save 10% towards the emergency fund, but your emergency fund's already full. Then you can have like 20% of your weekly paycheck or monthly paycheck towards splurging. Just whatever you want to do, go free. And some for maybe other projects or holidays or anything you have in mind. But the whole idea is to create systems and organize them accordingly. I have already made a detailed video on this. I'll leave an eye icon at the top below and I'll leave a link in the description on how to actually organize the buckets. But the main or the easiest way to do it is just having a couple of accounts in your bank account. So as soon as your payslip hits in the main account, it gets spread accordingly to the other accounts. That way you don't actually see the whole payslip and actually feel like sort of tempted on spending that money. We've covered basic financial literacy and now we've also got a system in place for you to keep your lifestyle inflation in check. Now let's move on to the fourth step in your investing journey this year. Have an emergency fund. And this may sound boring. It is very, very vital that people understand the true power of an emergency fund. I you'd be shocked and astonished by the figures I'll present to you in just a second of how many Australians are living in very unideal circumstances. You don't want to be placed in a situation where something happens, maybe a medical bill, something unfortunate happens, and then boom, your savings are wiped. Where do you go? You go to credit. And let's say you can't pay it off in time. What happens? Interest starts accumulating on your credit balance. The more interest accumulates, that's just wasted money. And then you go further into debt and then you got to probably work a bit more to pay off that debt. So just having an emergency fund protects 
protects you and keeps your mind safe. So I'll present the figures now. So I've got nifty data here, but according to Westpac, which is one of the big four banks here in Australia, on average, a Westpac group customer holds 22,000 in their transaction savings and term deposit accounts as of the 31st of December, 2021, pretty much the start of the end of last year, start of this year. And the thing is, this doesn't actually tell the true story as the data is skewed by some large deposit holders. The age range of 25 to 34 only have $8,000 worth in savings and 35 to 44 only have 12,000. And I can understand the majority of my viewers would not be in this place. If you're watching a video like this, I'm pretty sure you have good financial literacy or you're on the path. At least you're a decent saver. That's what I'll assume to an extent. But if you're not there, please get there. And you may say, sure, they may be one of the big four banks or people sometimes have fund across that bank, that bank, but it's still one of the big four banks. And it's still a shocking figure that there's only like what, 8,000 for 25, 34. And the 35 to 44 year olds who should be more mature only have 12,000, which is scary. And the reason why I keep harping on is that if something happens, let's say, you know, I had the whole scenario I gave with the credit card, then even the credit card trap where interest rates keep accumulating. Another thing you can happen is you have to sell your investments. And that's the worst thing and the worst feeling because it's like you're pulling a plant. You put a seed there and you're just pulling it before it's even ready. And we do not want to do that. That's like a very last resort of all kinds. Now we've got our basic financial knowledge in check. We also understand that we must increase the value of our time or we must simply make sure that time is it tied to our money. And now we also understand how we must have a system in place to keep lifestyle inflation in check. And now we've also discovered that we need an emergency fund for the bad times as well as just keeping our mind sane. The next step simply is to get started. I know this isn't a proper step, but it's something I had to put in here as I'm still shocked at how many people I've known throughout the years have been saying, you know, I'll get started. You know, I'll wait for the ETF bubble to burst. I'll wait for, you know, after the pandemic when it crashed, you know, I'll wait, the market's gonna correct itself again. Or, you know, after, you know, this, this current um, situation we have in Russia and Ukraine, you know, I'll wait till, for this to blow off. The problem is the more you delay, nothing happens. That's simply what it is. It's like that saying, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is now. I understand that you may lose some money potentially, so it's up to you to do your due diligence as you will make mistakes. You can go the safer route of obviously exchange trader funds just to keep everything safe. But what I want you to understand is that you will make some mistakes along the journey. It's fine. You may be like, oh, there's a bank with another better interest rate I should have looked at. Oh, you know, I could have put my money here. It would have saved me time. It would have been better use of my money. But the thing is, you, we'll all run into these. We just have to get started. Keep moving. Learn from our mistakes and keep moving. Because if you stand in that position of just paralysis by analysis, you'll never move forward. And you'll be here five years later, 10 years later. It's the same thing with property. They've been saying, um, oh, you know, we'll wait till it bursts or something. It's, it's not going to burst if it does for a very long time you may correct a little but you're just skin it in the game is more important and another thing is, is like with crypto right now no one's paying attention to cryptocurrency and it's gonna grow the hype is down and it's the best time to invest it's like warren buffett's quote which i highly recommend you do read and i actually understand it's be greedy when other people are fearful and be fearful when other people are greedy so when there's no hype that's when you should go in especially during a pandemic like that sort of situation but nevertheless i hope this video prompts and inspires you to take action whether that be reading a book putting some money or putting some skin in the the game because that's what you need to do now because most people in then two boats either they're new which from which i recommend read as well as get started little by little even get a demo account or there's people that like me before i was in the same boat made the mistake is that they just read they don't get started they don't do the work it's just like and they think they're progressing and they're moving forward it's like just because you're splashing water you aren't swimming you have to invest and get your skin in the game so please 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 get started break that mental barrier and go ahead with that being said i hope this video is beneficial and knowledgeable and prompted you to take a leap of faith into the investment journey as either you're someone who's young or someone who's been always sort of paralyzed by so much stuff going around the world. Hopefully this changes today. Please leave a comment saying I'm ready at the end of the video just to make, uh, just so I can know how many people have actually watched the video. Besides that, if you have any comments, any feedback, anything like that, please leave them down below so I can make a video or just answer some queries. Besides that, I hope you have a fabulous day ahead and get started and don't wait any longer. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.